Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to introduce our marginal rate of technical substitution. So sometimes we use the initials MRTS or sometimes just RTS. And I'm going to go through these subjects here. I'll first provide a definition for our marginal rate of technical substitution. I'll go through the interpretation of the figures for our marginal rate of technical substitution that we get back. I'll talk about the relationship between our marginal rate of technical substitution and the firm's isoquants. And then I'll derive a formula for our marginal rate of technical substitution, which includes our marginal productivities, which is a very common formula that you'll see for this measure. As per usual with my videos, the contents are in the description if you want to skip to any particular part. And just to start with a definition, very broadly, our marginal rate of technical substitution is going to tell us about the rate at which one input to production can be substituted for another input whilst holding output constant. To give an example, let's think about a factory that produces and packs bicycles. And in our factory, we can use laborers who can assemble and pack our bicycles manually, or we can get machines to do the work mechanically, or the work can be somewhat divided between the two methods. Now, very abstractly then, our firm's production function in this case would look something like this. We would have our output Y, that's the number of packed bicycles that we get at the end. And we have two inputs to production, capital K, which is our machines, and labor L, which is our laborers. Our marginal rate of technical substitution of labor for capital in this case will be equal to how much we reduce capital by if we increase labor by one unit and output is held constant. Now you might see these interpretations in terms of a marginal increase in labor rather than a one unit increase in labor. So I'll address that difference at the end of the video. In any case, let's just say that in our example, the firm can produce 50 bikes by using four units of labor and four units of capital. Our marginal rate of technical substitution of labor for capital then would be equal to, well, the decrease in the level of capital if we increase labor by one and output stayed constant at 50. So just in terms of interpreting the different figures that we might get back, if our marginal rate of technical substitution was 0.5, for instance, that's the figure that you get. Well, this would mean that the firm can substitute one labor for 0.5 units of capital, half a unit of capital, and that substitution would hold output constant. If our marginal rate of technical substitution was two, just to give another example, well, this would mean that the firm can substitute between one unit of labor and two units of capital, and that substitution would hold output constant. In terms of finding these values, the next thing to talk about is the relationship between the firm's isoquants and our MRTS. Now we often represent a firm's isoquants something like this, I've just got one up on the screen. You can also see on our diagram here, I have the amount of labor used on the horizontal axes and the amount of capital that the firm uses on the vertical axes. And the idea is that a single isoquant tracks the various combinations of inputs to production that can be used to make some fixed amount of output. So let's say that this isoquant corresponds to the firm producing 50 bikes. Well, this means that all of the points along this curve will indicate to us the different combinations of labor and capital that can give the firm exactly 50 bikes. And this means that we can actually mark down the point that we discussed previously. If you remember, we said before, if we had four units of labor and four units of capital, we could make 50 bikes with those inputs. So this would be one point on our isoquant, something like this, I'll call that point A. And the reason why isoquants matter to us is because the slope of our isoquants is actually equal to the negative of our marginal rate of technical substitution. Now to explain why, in general, the slope of a function is equal to, well, the change in the vertical axis variable when we increase the horizontal axis variable by one. So if we had a straight line, so something like this, if we know that the slope of the function is positive two, that just means that along our line, if we increase the horizontal axis variable by one, say from x is equal to three to x is equal to four, we would increase the vertical axis, which is y in this case, by 2. So from y is equal to 2 to y is equal to 4, and that movement would keep us on the same line. 
And in this case, because we do have a straight line, the slope isn't changing. So that ratio is going to be true for any point along our line. Now to find the slope, what we do is we calculate rise over run. So we take any two points along the line, we trace two lines between those two points, horizontal and vertical lines. Rise will be the amount of vertical movement between those two points. Run will be the amount of horizontal movement between the two points. That's how we find our slope. If we go back to our isoquant then, we can interpret the slope of our isoquant in a similar manner. It tells us about how much our vertical axis variable changes, which is capital, when we increase our horizontal axis variable, which is labor, by one. And of course, we're staying on the same isoquant line. So whilst we're moving between these two points, output is staying constant. So you can see then, remembering our definition of our MRTS, our MRTS is equal to how much we reduce capital by if we increase labor by one unit and output is held constant, that the slope and our marginal rate of technical substitution, they're basically identical. They tell us about the same thing. The only difference is that the slope will be negative because we have a downward sloping isoquant curve, but our MRTS is always reported as a positive. So we can say, and I set it up here, that the slope is equal to the negative of our MRTS. Another way to say this is that our MRTS is equal to the absolute value of the slope of our isoquant. And this means that in order to find our marginal rate of technical substitution, we can just find the slope of our isoquant and take that absolute value. Now, if we want an approximation to the slope of this curved isoquant, we can use rise over run with our discrete changes, just like when we had that straight line that I showed you before. So we would go between two points along this curve. We would take the change in capital. That would be our vertical axis variable. That would be rise. And we would divide it by the change in labor. That's our horizontal axis variable. That's our run. And we would get a value for the slope, which we could use as our MRTS if we take the absolute value. And this here, the absolute value of the change in K over the change in L as we move along an isoquant or as output is being held fixed, that will be like the simplest formula for our MRTS that you will find in your textbooks. In this case though, that calculation would only be an approximation because we have a curved isoquant. So the slope and thus our MRTS is constantly changing as we move along the curve. In order to get a more precise measure of the slope and thus of our MRTS, we can use derivatives. And that really brings us to our next topic, which is our marginal rate of technical substitution formula in terms of our marginal products of capital and labor. Since it's really this version of our formula, which we see most commonly, and we can introduce derivatives with that version, they are pretty easy to find. And what we will do is we'll first remember our production function, which I've got here. Output is a function of capital and labor. And it follows from this that any change in output that we see, that's our change in Y, must be due to our changes in our inputs to production. So a change in output will be equal to, well, any effect on output that we get due to a change in the level of capital, plus any effect that we get on output due to a change in the level of labor. All right, well, the effect of a change in capital on output can be further decomposed as, well, the marginal product of capital, that's MPK, times the change in capital. And here, our marginal product of capital is equal to the additional product that is achieved when we increase capital by a so one unit increase in capital. The change in capital tells us exactly by how much capital has changed by. So for instance, just to explain the logic of this decomposition, if we know that the marginal product of capital is equal to four, and this means that output Y increases by four every time that we increase our level of capital by one, if we actually increase capital by half of a unit, then the total effect on output would be equal to four. That's our marginal product of capital times 0.5. So that's equal to two. And this gives us then the total effect on output that a half a unit change in capital has. The effect of a change in labor on output can be understood in a similar way. We can take the marginal product of labor, MPL, that's the per unit effect of an increase in labor on output, and we can multiply that by the actual change in labor that we see that scales that effect up or down depending on how much labor actually changes. 
All right, well, the next trick that we're going to do is remember that along an isoquant, the change in output is equal to zero. And that's just by definition. As we move along an isoquant, output is held constant. So there's no change in output. So if we put that in our formula, we get zero is equal to our marginal product of capital times the change in capital plus the marginal product of labor times the change in labor. Let's move this marginal product of labor times the change in labor to the left hand side of our quality. So we get the negative of our marginal product of labor times the change in labor is equal to the marginal product of capital times the change in capital. And if we divide out the change in labor and our marginal product of capital from both sides, we get the negative of our ratio of marginal products, the marginal product of labor divided by the marginal product of capital, capital is equal to the change in capital divided by the change in labor. Now the right hand side here is our slope. As we said before, the slope is equal to rise over run, change in capital over the change in labor. And as we can see here, that slope is equal to the negative of our ratio of marginal products. And that leads us to the next definition of our marginal rate of technical substitution. We take the absolute value of that slope, so we remove the negative, and we find that our MRTS is equal to the ratio of marginal products. Now, our marginal product of labor itself is equal to the change in output divided by the change in labor, so like this. And the marginal product of capital is equal to the change in output divided by the change in capital, so like this. And this is where we can, if we want to, introduce derivatives if your coursework is at that level of analysis. Our marginal product of labor will be equal to the partial derivative of our production function with respect to labor. And our marginal product of capital is equal to the partial derivative of a production function with respect to capital, that's MPK. And what we're doing when we're using derivatives is basically making all of our discrete changes really, really, really small. In fact, infinitesimally small. And that allows us to essentially calculate the slope of an isoquant at any particular point. So if we looked at point A, for instance, if we used our derivatives to find our marginal rate of technical substitution, we would essentially be finding the slope of the line tangent to point A, so something like this, and we would take that value as our MRTS. And if we do go down this route of using our derivatives, the interpretation shifts a little bit, it gets a little bit more sophisticated. We start talking about marginal changes in our variables rather than changes of whole units. So our MRTS of labor for capital, for instance, we would talk about it as being equal to how much we reduce capital by if we increase labor by a marginal amount and output is held constant. And really that's the sort of language that you very often hear around our MRTS. If we do it without calculus, the changes are often discussed in discrete terms, so per unit changes. At more sophisticated levels, we instead talk about marginal changes in our variables. But really, whichever way we approach it, we're still talking about fundamentally substitutions between our inputs to production whilst holding output fixed. So that's it for this video. I hope that this video helped. If it did, please like and subscribe. You can also visit me now at www.econhelp.com.au for more resources to help you get through your economic study. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one, everyone.